the sun, our nearest star. In the fall of 2003, it unleashed an eruption of energy equal to 200 billion hydrogen bombs. Blasting a tidal wave of superheated charged particles at speeds of up to 6 million miles an hour. It was one of the largest solar storms ever recorded. And it was aimed at Earth. They were some of the fastest, hottest, and strongest storms ever measured. Assaulting the Earth, the sun's energy forced space station astronauts to take cover in their most sheltered compartments. Lights went out, communication streams were cut, airliners scrambled for safety. This really was a hurricane of space storms. Though no major damage was done, these storms were a stark reminder that we live at the constant mercy of the sun. It controls all aspects of our lives, our climate, our food, our bodies. We actually live inside the sun's atmosphere. We, along with all the other planets, are greatly influenced but is its influence changing? It's actually growing more powerful. Might we lose its protection from deadly cosmic rays? At its boundary, where it's protecting us from the intergalactic winds, that boundary is actually shrinking a bit. Will our technology-dependent society be able to handle another solar superstorm? Sometimes these effects can be so severe that they're catastrophic. And when will the next superstorm strike? for drop. Fall 2008. NASA launches IBEX, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer. Part of its mission is to study the effects the sun has on the furthest reaches of our solar system. IBEX joins the long list of human attempts to explain our star's impact on our solar system, our planet, and our lives. The sun. The sun provides all of our light and heat. If it weren't for the sun, we wouldn't be alive. We people are very interested in what goes around us. We like to understand our neighborhood. The sun in the universe is our street, our neighborhood. The sun. We are actually affected by its moods. In fact, it's like the parent and all the planets are the children that are affected by its moods. We need to know how it's going to evolve and how the changes that are always happening in the sun affect us here on Earth. The sun. If we want to understand the universe and the stars that make up the universe, then it's important to study the one that's closest to us. We've learned more about the sun in the past 40 or 50 years than in all of recorded history. This golden age of exploration was kicked off by a unique mission that gave us close-up images of our sun from above our atmosphere. Galeb, we're reading you loud and clear over the Vanguard for eight minutes. In 1973, Skylab became the first manned space station. It sent back images of the sun, clearer than anything taken from Earth. The Skylab mission was one of the very first laboratories that was dedicated just for the research and study of the sun. In some ways, it's kind of the grandfather of the, the current missions today. Right now, a fleet of about 20 space probes scan and study the sun in ways we never imagined, even 30 years ago. By studying the sun from the vantage of space, we can see it in a whole new light, using different light wavelengths, including X-ray and extreme ultraviolet. We can peel back its layers and begin to understand how and why the sun acts the way it does. The different wavelengths mean different temperatures, and different structures are more visible in different wavelengths than in others. Scientists have also been able to peek inside the sun using a technique called helioseismology, using the sun's own vibrations to study its interior activities. So the sun itself is, is not a solid body. Uh, it's, it's a giant ball of gas, and it, it oscillates, okay? it vibrates. So by measuring all these different frequencies of oscillation, we can go back and we can infer what the structure is inside the sun. Looking at the sun for long periods of time and with very good cameras and computer models, we can actually see 
different layers inside the sun. We can see the effects of turbulence layers, and we can see currents actually in the, the sun. And we can actually even use it to image the, the backside of the sun uh, that we don't see until it rotates around. And they've been able to actually detect sunspots on the far side of the sun from helioseismology. It's a really neat tool. Our robotic space probes never stop watching the sun. With their help, scientists are working out the big questions about our star. And we already know a lot. The sun is one of over 200 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. But it is our closest at 93 million miles away from Earth. Almost the same distance as 4,000 trips around the globe. And despite that distance, its light only takes eight minutes to reach Earth. It is only four and a half billion years into its nearly 10 to 11 billion year lifespan. And though technically a medium-sized star called a dwarf, it is enormous, 900,000 miles across. And if hollowed out, 1.3 million Earth-sized planets could fit inside. The sun accounts for 99.8% of the mass in the solar system. And it weighs 300,000 times more than the Earth. It is made up almost entirely of a superheated form of electrified and magnetized gas called plasma. The sun packs enough gravitational pull to keep the planets from spinning off into space. And as Copernicus first suggested, it rules the center of our solar system with a gravitational iron fist. Copernicus's model in which he placed the sun in the middle of the solar system with all the planets going around it instead of everything going around the Earth was a giant paradigm shift. It meant that the sun is the most important thing in the solar system. It meant that we really should understand the sun. Our sun, like all other stars in the universe, is made from the dust of stars that lived and died over billions of years, going all the way back to the Big Bang. So our sun and our solar system is really the debris from many generations of stars. The sun we see every day is the solar system's source of power. Deep in the center of our star, its core is superheated to 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and is the engine that drives it all. Inside the sun's core, the process of fusion is occurring, and that fusion process is giving off light and particles. Every second the sun shines, it releases the same amount of energy as one million H-bombs. The sun affects everything it touches, even us. To learn just how much, scientists sometimes rely on a remarkable cosmic coincidence. The sun's light is made of particles called photons, born in the core, then propelled by convection currents through the radiative and convective zones of the sun. Eventually, they reach the volatile outer layers of our nearest star. The sun's outer parts consist of three regions. There's the photosphere, or surface of the sun, and it's not really a hard surface like that of the Earth. The sun is gaseous throughout, and the temperature of the photosphere is around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Above the thin layer of the photosphere is another thin layer called the chromosphere, and the chromosphere is slightly hotter than the photosphere, which is counterintuitive because you would think that as you go away from the source of all the energy and heat, the core, that temperature would drop. But in fact, the temperature rises from the photosphere to the chromosphere, and it gets even hotter as you rise to the third layer of the atmosphere called the corona. And then beyond the chromosphere is a large, tenuous, extended region, the corona, which is millions of degrees. The sun produces a continuous outward flow of energy called the solar wind. Constantly blowing, it carries energy out into the solar system, extending our sun's reach 9.3 trillion miles, well beyond Pluto. The space in between the planets and the space in the entire solar system is not an empty void, but it's full of these particles and it's full of these rays of light. While the solar wind blows away from the sun, its gravity holds and pulls everything in. Take comets. All comets orbit the sun and can get pulled directly into the line of fire. Recently, scientists witnessed one of the sun's most dramatic outbursts, a coronal mass ejection ripping the tail off a comet. When it hit the comet, the tail was cut off like you took a knife, and the 
tail drifted away, and then it took a little more time for the comet to generate more gas and plasma and dust and create a tail. It tells us about how the solar wind moves in the solar system and how it can affect things. The lethal output of the sun has made studying it almost as difficult as understanding it. But scientists can get a good look at our nearest star thanks to a cosmic coincidence. A total eclipse of the sun. A total solar eclipse occurs when, from our perspective, the moon is exactly aligned with the sun and blocks its photosphere. It's a glorious sight. The solar eclipse is the most wonderful thing to see. It grows really dark by factors of thousands within seconds. And as it does become so dark, you can look up in the sky, you see the dark shadow coming from one direction, sweeping at you. It's really coming at thousands of miles an hour. So it's very impressive to see. Humankind has marveled at the mysteries of the eclipse for millennia. Scientists have used it as an opportunity to see the sun's outer atmosphere, the enigmatic corona. One of the hottest regions of the sun, energy from the corona radiates out to the edge of the solar system. The entire solar system actually sits in this outer corona of the sun. So this atmosphere of the sun is bathing all the planets the engineers who built the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, or SOHO, installed an artificial eclipse into the space probe. Called a coronagraph, it does the same thing as a natural eclipse, blocking out the blinding rays of the sun, so scientists can try and answer an old question. How does the solar corona get so hot? After all, the everyday surface of the sun, the photosphere, is only around 10,000 or a little more Fahrenheit. And the corona, on the other hand, is millions of degrees hot. If you go away from a stove, you know it gets cooler, but if you go away from the everyday surface of the sun, it gets hotter, and how is that? It all starts at the sun's core, where every second, nearly 700 million tons of the universe's most common element, hydrogen, are converted into helium through nuclear fusion, giving off the energy that becomes photons, otherwise known as light. The sun's core is really hot, several tens of millions of degrees. And there, the temperatures are so high that protons, hydrogen nuclei, can come together, grab each other, fuse eventually into helium, and in this way, release energy. What happens with these photons, they go through this process, what we call a random walk, where they have to go through the layer of the sun, they get absorbed and then reabsorbed into lots of different photons at lower energy level. So this process of being absorbed and reabsorbed millions of times can take 150,000 years. Once out of the sun's interior, photons are only eight minutes away from Earth, but they're leaving behind a world in constant motion. The solar surface boils. Energy rises constantly from below. Coils of plasma and energy called coronal loops spring across the sun while dark regions known as sunspots stretch thousands of miles. And at only 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, these sunspots are the coolest part of the sun, emitting less light than the surrounding area. If you were to pluck a sunspot away from the sun and place it in the sky, it would actually be as bright as the full moon. Sunspots appear on the surface and are easy to see. Their genesis, however, is tied to the sun's deep interior and complex rotation. The sun doesn't rotate like a solid body. Instead, it rotates more quickly near the equator than near the poles, which leads to sunspots. The equator completes one rotation in 25 days. Mid-latitudes complete one rotation in about 30 days. And near the poles, one rotation is completed in about 35 days. Called differential rotation, this process makes the sun's interior churn at different speeds, creating intense magnetism in the form of millions of magnetic field lines, which get mixed up as the sun's interior twists up like a rubber band. This builds up pressure, which makes them buoyant. So they float to the surface, and where they pop through the surface, they create sunspots. Once on the surface, the now twisted and balled up magnetic field lines block the convection of super hot plasma from rising.